BCFG2 in the house? CF engine? No? Okay. Um, cool. So um, hopefully we won't bore you too much with the intro stuff since everybody's fairly familiar. Um, we're still going to run through it, but um, we'll make it quick and then we'll start talking about um, what Proviso is all about. Um, but first, we'll introduce ourselves. Um, so again, this is uh, our sessions on Proviso, um, which is a goal to sort of standardize vagrant-based Drupal development. Uh, I'm Patrick Connolly. I work at MyPlanet Digital back in Toronto, Canada. Um, I guess we're, I, I'm not a DevOps team, but I'm, I work there and just try to um, help teams create tools um, to help them self-serve their own, their own infrastructure internally for our projects. I am Howard Tyson, Tizzo on Drupal.org, Twitter, and anywhere else I can get it. Um, I work at a company called ZivTech where I kind of do a lot of the tech direction and work on a lot of our stack tools and, um, and have kind of been really focused on building out our hosting infrastructure and our vagrant stuff and making that as slick as possible. Um, and so I've been spending a lot of time on kind of that side of things. So, um, so I, we kind of wanted to frame this with a little bit of history. So in the beginning of website development, uh, local development was hard. Um, because you probably had to kind of set up all the different pieces yourself for a LAMP infrastructure. There were endless screencasts on it. Lots of people back then were still using Windows before this kind of Mac revolution where everybody has a glowing Apple if they work in tech. Um, so you're probably doing it on Windows, so you just didn't. And a lot of people just kind of went in and used FTP and just kind of said this whole local thing's too hard. Do it live! Um, I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So, so that was Bill O'Reilly saying, screw it, we'll do it live. I'm really disappointed after all that. Our audio stopped working again. <laughs> um, anyway, so... Uh, so then we started to build tools. Uh, we were the monkeys with the bone, and that's the sort of tool that we built. And we called it MAMP and WAMP and ZAMP, and it worked on my machine. This is a vagrant talk, so we had to have the obligatory it works on my machine slide, right? Um, and you had Drupal running locally, but was Solar running? Was Memcache running? Was Varnish running? Redis, SSL, Selenium? Um, there were all these pieces that you really needed that you just didn't have. And so for those parts, a lot of people still ended up just developing on production or on something like it because those tools just weren't easy to set up. Um, and then there was Vagrant. Welcome to the future. Um, and so that's where we stand today. Vagrant creates virtual machines on any environment. Um, hopefully you guys all know you can kind of provision it with any of those provisioners we were talking about. Um, which led us to this rise of all of these different Vagrant projects and all of these different machines. Um, we can just run Vagrant up, and um, all of the stuff was working perfectly in rehearsal. Um, and um, Vagrant Bundle installs all of our plugins. Vagrant has a lot of awesome plugins. We're leveraging a lot of them in the Proviso project. Um, and it builds your system. Um, but, uh, oops. Sorry. But um, this kind of led to this proliferation of lots and lots of different vagrant projects. This rise of the machine has led to um, kind of an insurmountable and daunting set of overlapping tools and people working on the same stuff. Oh God, there are so many tools and so many machines rising up in this flow where um, we've got the Drupal Vagrant project, Oscar, Ariadne, uh, Oscar again, <laughs> Quick Start, <laughs> Drupal Pro, Agar Up, Dev Shop, Drupal Lamp, the uh, Vagrant Dev VM. Um, we've all been reinventing the wheel and we've all been doing things slightly differently, but mostly the same. Um, and there hasn't been a place where people have been coming together to start sharing best practices and starting to assemble sort of how is it that this community should be doing this and what are we sort of trying to replicate? 
And I think there's sort of an upside and a downside to that because part of the idea with Vagrant is you can use your real provisioners, um, your real source that's gonna be running on production to build your dev infrastructure. If you build and maintain your own dev infrastructure, the thing is that a lot of companies don't. A lot of companies have some sites that run on Pantheon, some that run on Acquia, some that run on the client's hosting. Um, and so there's an awful lot of kind of shared stuff. Um, and there was no way to collaborate and no space for that until now. That's the baby from 2009. Um, just in case you didn't get that running through. Um, so Proviso was born. So what happened was a whole bunch of us that have been working on this stuff got together at uh, DrupalCon Portland and started saying, oh, you wrote a little SSH plugin to automatically add your SSH key to SS agent to do the thing so Git would work? I did that too. Oh, yours is kind of better. Oh, but mine does this thing. Um, and we started realizing that there was a whole lot of kind of overlapping effort and we should kind of pull together and start coming up with ways to collaborate. Um, so what is Proviso? Um, it's a community project to assimilate them all. Um, resistance is futile. If you've got your own vagrant project, just, just come on board. Um, so first off, um, more than anything else, Proviso aims to be a community. It aims to start conversations and get us working in a place where we can start to assemble best practices and look at each other's code and, um, and start contributing to a common thing. Um, don't we have a community? Yes, we do. We have, um, especially folks that are working on this kind of stuff. A lot of people hang out on groups.drupal.org slash DevOps slash high performance. Um, those conversations aren't as active as they probably could and should be based on how much time we're all spending on this. Um, but most of the stuff that's happening there is conversing, not converging. We talk about, hey, I have this bug on my server. Um, but there's no easy way to sort of replicate that issue, to be able to set up exactly um, exactly what your server looks like and say, let's make a tweak and benchmark um, in a way that all of us can kind of reproduce, all of us can contribute to, all of us can start to um, figure out what should a secure server look like, what should a high performance server look like, um, what's the performance implication of terminating SSL with Nginx versus Apache versus whatever. And just as an example, like there's, if you look on securing your Drupal site uh, on Drupal.org, there's a, a bunch of pages, uh, a bunch of sub pages on how to secure a server. And it's all, it's all words, it's not executable. And everyone's doing this when they find it, hope, hopefully they're doing this on their own. Um, yeah, so uh, the idea is, it's code is conversation. Um, so, uh, let's see. Oh, right, so, so the idea is can we kind of follow some of the more recent DevOps best practices of um, can we have code over documentation? Instead of having a checklist, can we have a chef cookbook or a puppet module that just shows you what those steps should be so that you can look at a working machine? Um, because if you sort of, if you're building a chef cookbook, or sorry, yeah, chef cookbook or a puppet module um, that has all of those steps captured in it, in a way that's clearly understandable. Both of those tools have optimized for being able to read and understand what's being specified in there. So that's sort of the best form of documentation because it actually will then run. And it's not a checklist that needs to be maintained, needs to be updated, um, and you know you're not missing a step if it works, right? Um, so the idea is if we can pull all of this in, this is such a sales pitch, most of this presentation. If we can get all of you guys to come to Proviso and start um, pulling some of the conversation there, um, we can start to turn more and more of our best practices into community modules that we can all use and share locally and on our remote servers, potentially. Um, so how? This is where we start to get into the technical implementation of how we're trying to tackle this project. Um, so, um, so Proviso is sort of, um, actually, yeah, I, uh, I skipped a couple of bullets there, didn't I? Um, Proviso is, uh, Proviso's an initiative, uh, in addition to being a community. 
Um, it's not a finished product. It is a thing that we are trying to get more momentum on and trying to get more people contributing to. It's not that we don't have code. It's not that we don't have stuff running. It's just that um, like how we get together and talk about Drupal core initiatives where we think something's a good idea and a lot of people are pushing on it, that's where Proviso is especially right now. Um, so we're trying to work to find the best ways to share because sharing is caring. Um, it's also a Vagrant project, so the idea is that uh, teams that need a Vagrant development environment can use ours, and we can, again, start to reduce duplicate effort with all of those freaking projects that we listed before that mostly set up a LAMP stack. Um, and then another thing is to make it uh, accessible. I don't know if any of you guys have been following the Calamuna guys. They're this, uh, they're this dev company that's been working on this project called the Calabox. It's very cool. It is a wrapper around Vagrant and VirtualBox that gives you a one-click installer for OS X. They hope to have one for Windows eventually. And then they used Node.js um, and some desktop-y Node.js packaging to build a pretty slick GUI. So it's kind of modeled after the MAMPs and the WAMPs and the ZAMPs out there, where you have this like status page that says whether Calabox is running, whether it's got Nginx up, MySQL up, whether the SSH keys are installed, um, so whether Solar's installed and running, whether WebRoot is, um, rating of happiness, it's maximal. You'll be glad to hear. Um, and um, the idea is that you've got a list of local sites. You've got a list of your sites on Pantheon. Um, you've got a list of the different tools. These are like quick um, jump in points for things like PHP MyAdmin. Um, you've got commands so that you you can um, you can they have they have some sort of nice wrappers to do things like. Um, pull down copies from Pantheon. Um, some of that still f is a little still in, in progress, but, but a lot of it works pretty slickly. Um, and then the plan is eventually there's going to be a deploy so that you can actually then deploy sites that you've built locally um, onto Pantheon. And just to add on that, the, uh, the idea is like if, if you're not using Pantheon, they, uh, each of these panes, I guess they're looking to make it extensible so that like if this, you know, you're, you need an Octavia pane, you work with Octavia, or there's another tool that you'd like to resurface in there. Um, yeah, they want to they, they want to make it so like it's 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 opinionated, but you can always extend on those opinions or like remove ones that you don't agree with. Um, so the next big component that we need to solve um, that we're working on hashing out um, and starting to write code around is exactly how to make this part possible. Because how do we pull a bunch of people together if they don't have quite the same needs? Um, you say tomato, I say tomato. You say I run Apache, I say I run Nginx. Um, how do we allow all of that to live under one roof in one project? And our idea is to um, make sure that there are sort of individual pieces that can be turned on and off and kind of assembled um, with some sensible defaults so that you can um, piece together the individual parts. Um, so you can pick your provisioners, um, and you can pick from service packages. We'll talk about a little bit more of what I mean by pick from uh, provisioners in a second. Um, to be able to tack on your own pieces um, and leverage mostly what's, uh, what's already in the community. Um, so you'll notice that Proviso has both Chef and Puppet. Uh, yeah, sure. I guess this, the idea of making it multi-vendor was, was, I think, kind of the original catalyst. And it was uh, basically stemmed from all our frustration where we were in the same room of the fact that we're only talking now because we're talking about how we're complaining about how we're not talking. And like one of the, it seemed like one of the roots of why we, we weren't collaborating on these things and the, these ecosystems around, whether it's like how we're using plugins or like little helper scripts, uh, was because the big, what we all thought of as the big component, the provisioner, we were speaking different languages. So the thought was that, like, uh, you know, it's very common in enterprise to, like, as a security measure, to choose a multi-vendor approach. You don't lock into any one. You actually, you know, it seems a little redundant, but you cover, you use different products, and then if you need to swap out, that's actually safe for you. And it makes it simple to, you know, if things don't go in one direction with a product, you have this other one that's ready to go. Um, so the thought was we could take that approach with, um, with this project as well and get us all in the same room kind of thing and in the same issue queues.
Um, also, I don't know if you guys have all seen the To Do MVC site. Um, to Do MVC is this uh, group of people that took the Backbone JS, Backbone the front end JavaScript framework. Uh, they took the Backbone JS example, which was this little simple to do list, and they started porting it to every other sort of implementation. So, what we're kind of hoping is uh, that we can get some other people that are involved in some of those other projects. That's kind of partly other provisioners, sorry, th people that are using other provisioners. So I'm a puppet guy. Um, Pat's a chef guy. We're still friends. And we're hoping that some of you are Ansible guys or salt girls and that you can come and, and join us and um, that maybe we can kind of be the to-do MVC of provisioners where we have one set of sort of acceptance criteria, we have one set of sort of feature requirements, we have implementations in Puppet and Chef and Ansible, and that way it's an easy place to go and sort of compare and contrast how this tool sort of organizes and assembles um, the different things that need to be built. Um, so sort of if you go to Todo MVC, you can go and look at the same thing um, the same feature set, the same kind of front end, built with Angular and Backbone and Batman and all the crazy JavaScript frameworks. Um, so the goal is hopefully, as we continue to build out this multi-vendor support, right now we've got, um, actually right now we've got pull requests pending that get us all the way to, um, to a uh, LAMP stack and with Chef and Puppet. But we'd like to get We'd like to get more so that we can kind of be this middle ground for comparing and contrasting projects. Yeah, so it also lowers the barrier to jump ship. Because right now, if you have started to build a to tooling around one and you're building that tooling on your own, then just say, you know, just say you look at this, you know, this analog of to do MVC and you recognize, wow, like it seems really more straightforward how Chef is building this exact same thing. Um, and you now, if you're using if you're using the puppet tooling, then you can kind of jump to the other and try it for a while, and you're 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 in a bit of a safe a safe zone where you're not like starting from scratch and having to learn how to replicate your full you know whatever you had before. Um, okay, so um, maybe I'll take a second to um, just mention. I think we get to this later too, but. Um, so one of the things that when I say like uh, we have you know feature parity between all these uh, between the chef provisioner and puppet provisioner and whatever else we include the idea of a big part of this is to have a common set of um, of integration tests that are basically testing the built stack and ensuring and we're we're doing this using um, uh, using a combination of Travis CI a tool that Opscode who maintains Chef have created called um, Test Kitchen which is for like basically spinning up um, a bunch of test suites, um, a matrix of a bunch of test suites and a bunch of different platforms and running, um, building, running the, running the puppet modules or running the chef, the chef cookbooks and then running final integration tests and making sure that, you know, it's memcache is available and uh, Apache's, re Apache's responding in a certain place. Um, so yeah, y it's, it, you, have a, you know that you have a, a, this feature parity in between stacks and uh, the idea is that we're testing this on every commit um, using by spinning them up on Amazon basically every time. So I think that um, that was automated testing from day one is one of our goals. Um, so just to elaborate on what Pat said, so here's an example um, from uh, one of our pending pull requests um, that, uh, that we've got uh, tests that can reach out and run from Travis CI spinning up the Amazon instances. And you can see these are um, each of the things reporting back. Is it running on CentOS 64? Um, or is that CentOS 64, right? CentOS uh, 63, CentOS 64, Precise 64-bit, um, Lucid 64-bit, and getting back all like results on all of those. Um, in terms of the upstreams, uh, we just wanted to comment on the fact that um, we're big fans of Librarian, both Librarian Puppet and Librarian Chef. We're using that to pin all of our dependencies and to kind of enforce best practices where we're pulling from community cookbooks and modules and trying to force ourselves to either produce a new community module or cookbook or find one that already does what we're looking to do. Um, how many people here are using community modules or cookbooks primarily? Rolling your own primarily? 
most of you guys that raised your hand saying you were using Puppet or Chef aren't doing either creating your own or using Puppet or using community stuff. Um, fair enough. I don't think Puppet's doing very much for you guys. I've just got a quick question. Um, I saw you're talking about different distributions there. Mm -hmm. um, are you talking about using the same golden images? Are you building those from a set set of scripts? I mean, where are those images coming from? Because that's obviously an underlying piece here. Right. So, um, so, the I yeah. Um, so it, it's kind of people are having to package up um, the base images. Like there, there are there's base ones on Amazon that are basically kind of the stock um, CentOS 60 image. The idea is we're going from uh, the very the very basic install, um, and now y you know most most um, most OS maintainers actually put those packages out on Amazon. And they're kind of getting the habit of actually creating vagrant base boxes and providing them. So we're not, in, as a community, rolling them all on our own. And uh, Mitchell Hashimoto, the vagrant maintainer, actually wrote this cool project called Packer that's helping everyone do this. And there's, yeah, there's. That, that's kind of where I was going was because you get like VWE and things like that that basically are scripts to take an ISO and build an image out of it. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if that's he, sort of on the horizon there to include it, that, that basically you've got it. Okay, we're going to. Because if you're building everything essentially from packages, you really want that absolute minimal system, and that's mm -hmm. usually the biggest problem is, is you have to make sure that everybody's on that exact same minimal system, and if yeah. you have the script, you guarantee that we built it from an ISO to this standard. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, and just encouragement everyone, like, that. that's awesome that you just got up and asked the question, so anyone else who has a question in the middle, do that, <laughs> that's great. Um, so the, uh, the, as Pat said, the tests that run on Amazon aren't actually running through Vagrant, really. They're um, provisioning from Amazon base images. And while it is kind of a golden image in that it's cloning the existing kind of Amazon image, which allows us to do it fairly quickly, um, not anything is not much is pre-installed on that. Um, it's pretty much a clean install. There's not like a golden image that has to have Apache and other stuff on it. At the moment, we're relying on base boxes for Vagrant that have Puppet pre-installed, but I think we have Omnibus, yeah. the Omnibus plugin that'll um, put Chef on so that you're on the Chef side, you can have a really clean install. On the Puppet side at the moment, we're still pulling Ubuntu box. We're still relying on an Ubuntu box that has Puppet pre-installed at the right version, which is um, suboptimal. Um, so uh, this part gets hand wavy, or <laughs> um, but uh, at the moment we're just setting up a, a basic lamp stack uh, because that's kind of our uh, minimal viable product. But the idea is that we want to ship with some simple switches that can say, "Give me a, your best approximation of Acquia, give me your best approximation of Pantheon," so that we can sort of um, reduce the com reduce the chances for having different variables. Right? That's one of the big promises of ending it works on my machine is that you can have something really close to production. We have lots and lots of people running on basically the same production. Um, it would be really great if Acquia and Pantheon published um, Vagrant boxes. Turning over all of their configuration and secret sauce is probably not something that is easy for them. Um, but, uh, but they have both, people from both teams have been um, forthcoming saying, you know, like, we'd like to be supportive uh, at some level. And, and kind of share. So the Pantheon guys especially have been really open. The Acquia guys have nodded at conferences and said they'd like to be at least. Um, so we're hoping that we can get a little bit more support from them. Obviously, we won't ever get it perfect because they've got some special sauce behind the scenes. Um, but we think we can get it pretty close, um, having a really similar setup. Um, and then the idea is that we're going to have some fairly human-readable YAML component lists um, that pull in sort of uh, meta cookbooks and meta puppet modules, which would be the only thing that actually lives in our project, um, so that you can sort of have mix and match things where um, you mostly have the same Apache stack across several different kind of um, platforms that we're imitating, or the same Nginx stack. Um, probably the same Redis release could be, you know, the same Redis version could be the same item that drops into a YAML list. Um, and the idea is that we can have a space in the repository where you can add your own um, we're still figuring out the exact best way to model that. So it, it sounds like lots of you guys are familiar with uh, with Chef, and there's the idea of the, the run list, which you can build dynamically and basically drop drop roles in that that are the different layers 
of the stack that we're building. So the only thing that needs to be, you know, you just configure in the YAML what what are the what are the core set of roles that we want in here, and we've got those roles defined in our in our project. And just last night we hashed out how what the equivalent of that would be in um, in Puppet just to make it work in a Chefy like way that that um, that would jive with how we want how we see this this project layering. Yeah, kind of a mix of some custom fact plugins, factor fact plugins, and some magic to make Puppet pretend that it's a dynamic language. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, room to add your own components I think is critical because I know at my company um, we use some tools that we've written to be able to make synchronizing our environments with our remotes really simple um, where we're running our own hosting. We're going to want to be able to drop that stuff in and we're not going to be able to move from our own system which is on our GitHub thing, it's open source, but we're not going to be able to move that to, from that to the shared thing that we're not the sole maintainers of um, until we can kind of easily plug in customizations without forking. Um, so that's kind of our kind of next big priority, which is why we spent a bunch of time last night kind of figuring it out. Um, still don't have audio. So um, this is where we transition to kind of a, a section on Imagineering. Um, so this is kind of uh, a bunch of stories of where we think Proviso could be useful to people, and hopefully we can get some feedback from you guys uh, on whether this is the kind of stuff you were hoping to see from this project when you read our description and decided to spend 45 minutes with us. Um, so, um, Danger, Will Robinson! Danger! No, Will Robinson! Danger! That's uh, Danger, Will Robinson with the waving arms there. Um, so the first thing, do you want, do you want to take this one? Uh, so uh, the idea is uh, platform flu fluidity is the first scenario. Um, so the idea that you know, the situation is you're getting ready to host on Ubuntu 12.04. You've been developing for a while. You've been developing locally with Proviso. Um, this is in the possible future where this is a success and people are using it. Um, so uh, halfway through the project, uh, a client says that here Linus endorses Red Hat Linux 5.2. Can we do that? Uh, and th this isn't true. Lin Linus doesn't do this. But, uh, but this is an enterprise client. And what they say is very serious. So in other words, Linus does say this, and it is true. Um, so with Proviso, the idea is that you can see which platforms are supported and tested at a glance by just reading the readme and seeing, hey, these are the things that we have tested on and that we have built this stack on and run this individual test suites different layered stacks. Um, and you can actually go to Travis and look at the test runs. So even if you see that the build status is not successful right now, or one platform isn't available, you can kind of like, you can go through and see all the evidence of maybe where that platform stopped being supported because it wasn't, you know, it was old and it was like Lucid or something like that. And you can see, you know, evidence of, um, it's very transparent. It's not just saying, hey, we support this. You can actually go and look at the tests that say what we support and if we don't support something what you will have to overcome. Um, so, sure. Um, and that story, uh, that, that hypothetical story of where a client says that uh, Linus insists that this one flavor of Linux is the only one that he endorses, um, that, that actually happened. I was, I was told that Linus, he takes money under the table from CentOS. And that's why that you really need to use CentOS, because he said that. But, you know, client's always right, right? Uh, so uh, I guess just a little more on what makes that possible. Like I said, the testing infrastructure makes it possible to easily at a glance look at this. Um, but also the fact that we're using robust community cookbooks. Like we're not just using a custom cookbook that we built that applies for our platform. Most of, especially in the chef community and more so in the puppet community, um, they are, the, the cookbooks are very, very multi-platform. Um, sometimes that makes them very large. Some people have opinions about that. But overall, it's, it's really nice, especially when you're new and coming into this, the fact that you can just, you can swap these things out pretty, pretty easily. Um, so it's, still, it's still a little rougher in the Puppet community. We're, we're still getting there. But it's more and more as the community stuff works. So um, yeah, that's scenario one. Um, scenario two is uh, the idea of um, helping overcome the idea of, or deal with imprecise stack versioning. So oops. So uh, just for example, MySQL. Acquia is running 5.5.34, and you're running 5.5.32 on, on your local machine. Um, a lot of people will look at this and they'll be like, yeah, it's all 5.5. It's all, uh, so it's all the same, right? 
Um, so no, no, it's not. So if you just look at the, um, like the, the MySQL change logs are scary sometimes. Uh, so if you just look at a tiny patch release, this is the, this is the point three three, the number three three patch release. Um, you had three different versions of three patch releases just in between that thing that seemed like a small, probably a small change. Um, and this is the very top of the page. Here's the rest of the page. And the, all of these, it's just like itemized bullet lists. This is one of the small ones that just go down for a long way. And each one is a change that has happened internally in the system. And each one of these represents a scenario where maybe <laughs> something crazy is happening and you're seeing a little bit of a, a difference between environments. And maybe you'll spend a day trying to troubleshoot this. Um, so these, this is all the wild card variation that gets introduced when you're dealing with like slightly small pin versions or differences in, in versions. Um, so I guess the thought is that uh, you, um, like in this example, if you know um, the standard version um, that's available in the package repositories is one, and you know Acquia has rolled their own and have a slightly newer one, um, you don't have to make that compromise and deal with maybe the, all these big differences. Um, the idea is we're working on this together. Uh, those we have an Acquia role, and we've we've said, hey, this is important, so we're figuring this out. We're going to mimic them where this is important. Um, and you know, one person does this, a few people do the work, and everyone gets the benefit. Um, scenario three uh, is the idea of this could be a great opportunity to work together on tooling that makes this like not just a, de a development environment, but a, an SDK for working in the Drupal community, a software development kit. So it, like the idea that maybe it's the, we're talking about the idea that maybe this could become the de facto way of, um, of doing regular routine community tasks. Um, so can we um, can it be a standard tool to help us say, file better support support issues? Um, so you know traditional support issue in the Drupal.org core queue. My site's broken, and some rather scant details <laughs> on what that is. But I guess the thought is, um, you know, wouldn't it be great if the uh, if we had one tool that we were rallying around and we could say, hey, could you just reproduce this in Proviso? That's kind of the bare the bare minimum that we'll ask of you to get our full attention. Um, and uh, so the current approach, even if like, you know, the simple approach of just like Proviso as a regular Vagrant environment is you run, you know, Vagrant up, Vagrant SSH, um, you do a quick Drupal um, and load in the views module and enable it, and then you set a variable, just say that's what it needs to reproduce the bug and go to this page and you'll see it kind of thing. And now uh, the person, the maintainer, follows this advice, sees the bug, and can immediately deal with it. Saves everyone time, they're incredibly happy. But we can even create some, um, some more tooling in the form of Vagrant plugins that serve our needs. Um, and uh, that just essentially drive Drush inside. Um, so this is, this is in some ways tangentially related to building a Vagrant development environment, but this, I guess, could form like the issue queues where we're, where we're building this are a great place to have these discussions about uh, building these tools. Um, there's a, you know, also a hypothetical. Uh, could we create a standardized uh, a, a, a Vagrant plugin that helps us deal with bug reports in the community? So, um, oh, yeah, that's out of place. <laughs> um, so the I'll, I'll just skip to the next one for um, easy for the. Could we build another tool for um, for easy testing of patches in the issue queues? Um, I just like this old man with a patch. <laughs> There's no reason this has to be here. Uh, so like a hypothetical Vagrant command, which we could very easily do, and I'll just walk through that. So a uh, Vagrant proviso, patch test, and give it the, um, and feed in the argument for the path to the patch, the, the text file. So we can easily get the issue number from this. Uh, we can go to that page. Um, this is easy to do with the Vagrant plugin and you know, some, Ruby, some Ruby gems. Uh, scrape that scrape that page. Uh, find the core version and the module that it's talking about. Find the dependencies for those modules by checking um, the XML updates. Um, the same thing that you check when you when you're looking for updates, um, or that your Drupal site checks when you're looking for updates. Um, also, you know, look on that page. Find the place where that patch is linked, and and then find the date of that comment, and then load in that version that that head, the commit that was at the head on that day. Because everyone, when they're doing their patches, they're doing it against the head. Um, so anyway, this is just a quick one-liner that now maybe this environment, this environment actually helps people in the issue queues, and it's a you know a common place that we're going to to solve our problems and the things we deal with every day, which right now have a bunch of different tooling around. Um, so last scenario is the idea of uh, remote deployment. So just say you've working, you've been working locally with Proviso, 
and your original plan was to host with, say, Panda or Akio. Uh, but then uh, you realize something. MongoDB and Node.js are freaking sweet. You really want to use them, but they're not, those don't exist on those larger platform providers. You see you've been developing on a role that emulates Akio. Um, but now you can, instead of being kind of at a, a dead end where now you have to totally rebuild a stack that works for you, um, you've already been developing on one that we have as a community built to emulate, say, Acquia. And, um, and you can just, you know, there's some work to figure out how to write your cookbooks, hopefully leveraging community cookbooks to get MongoDB and, and uh, Node.js set up. Um, but you do those customizations and we have that, that conversation in the common place and maybe, and maybe you share back for the next person. And now you've got, um, you've got your remote, your local development environment and uh, simply by using Vagrant AWS, the plugin that allows Vagrant to push remotely, you don't just have a, a local development environment. You you know you actually have um, something that you can spin up and and you know at the very least use it as a scratch base, but maybe later you know actually host your live site on it. Um, so yeah, uh, those are like yes, end of Imagineering period. Uh, so, anyone have any questions on what the goals of this project are, or like, what your thoughts are? Yes, awesome. Um, <clears throat> well, mainly I'm just uh, wondering how far along are you, actually? Um, and maybe I should explain a little bit about mm -hmm. my situation. Uh, we're deploying on um, Amazon and are planning to use uh, OpsWorks, uh, which is used in Chef. Uh, and as far as I can see, we, we can get some really Really good stuff out of um, having a Git repository with our uh, cookbooks and tell Opsworks to just look for the, the cookbooks there and deploy. Um, the run list, I guess, is uh, managed in the in the Opsworks um, configuration. Um, it would be really, really great if, if we very easily could make a, a vagrant chef uh, solution that would look at the same cookbook repository and, well, basically do the same. Um, am I looking at the right project then? The, the I, like, this is a great place where, uh, where it would be wonderful if we were having conversations in a common place because a, a lot of, like, even to build a chef repo or the cookbook repository, that's done in a lot of different ways and there's um, lots of thoughts that the, the wider community talk, uh, um, has about, um, about how to best organize that. And like, if, I mean, I, my personal thoughts would be like using librarian or Berkshell and that doesn't, um, that doesn't, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't mutually exclude um, using this project to figure out how to build your, um, uh, how to build it using uh, Amazon service. Because um, it's a very concise definition and it just tells you exactly which, you know, we're, if we're doing this right, um, all our cookbooks aren't living inside this project. They're actually out there. Whenever we need something, even a little bit special sauce, we're, we're publishing a, a cookbook to wrap around <coughs> that that's external to this project and we're pulling it in with um, using those um, those cookbook that cookbook package manager whichever one it is so the thing the fruits of what of the labor that goes on here can there's if we're doing it right we're pushing it all out anyway so you can choose to resurface it and use it with Amazon um, and that's that's no real issue but I mean hopefully the count I guess the idea is the Drupal community has very specific needs on how to optimize the stack and right now a lot of those really exciting conversations kind of happen in the engine like among the engineers at Acquia and among the engineers at Pantheon I mean they do awesome work and they push out great features for us but they don't we don't have any place for these conversations to happen among um, you know people who are who are building their own stacks right so if the question is um, will proviso will proviso help me to um, also either pronunciations fine um, will proviso help me to uh, to take a chef run list that I have and a bunch of chef cookbooks that I have and turn them easily into a Vagrant project. Um, I mean, I think Vagrant only takes a couple of lines to do that part. Um, but um, hopefully the idea is exactly like Pat said, it will at least serve as a place for um, you to see vetted community vetted modules and a reference implementation of how the community considers this best done. Um, which isn't to say that like the five of us working on this are the, co the community that decides how this is best done, but uh, hopefully after this session you'll all yell at us and tell us how we're doing it wrong and we can do it better. Um, and then it will be community vetted and 
and we'll have like sort of a consensus on how it's best done. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, I want to thank you guys because I have played with a number of the existing solutions and found them all to have positives and negatives. And I was at the point where I was like, I need to build a dev environment to hand out to my devs that I know is solid. And I was going to end up having to reinvent the wheel again. And I didn't want to do that. So this is great because I will absolutely contribute stuff back. I guess my question is, what's the scope I mean, it, it, you, you went to the Imagineering thing, and so obviously you can, you can go really wide with it. But, um, so somebody in this room says, hey, I want to contribute. They're working on Chef. They don't know anything about Puppet. Is somebody at that point going to say, well, okay, wait, we've got to make sure we port some of the same stuff over to Puppet to keep them parallel? Because that seems like a huge complication unless you've got people willing to take that responsibility because that initial contributor is not going to go learn Puppet to go put the other side of the patch in. Um, so that's number one. And number two, how deep are, do you want to get? Do you want to keep this as just being a basic lamp stack? Is this going to become something where we put uh, pieces in potentially to turn on for developers? So we install, you know, um, particular editors. You know, I mean, obviously, if it's available through Chef, it, there's a cookbook someplace. Is that going to be sitting, I guess this kind of goes to the previous question, how much of that is going to get rolled into the distribution and how much is going to be like, well, you can add that to your own custom thing. We're not going to put that in. And I'm, so that's always a tough question. And also I realized that we didn't exactly answer how far this currently is. Um, so I think if you clone the repository right now, you get the, you know, github.com slash proviso slash proviso. If you clone the repository right now, you get something that, um, that has the magic to do the um, puppet or chef librarian work to pull in whatever is defined and build up the box using either chef or puppet. All of that stuff is in that repository. And then Pat has a fork that has the chef kind of lamp stack cooking. And I've got a fork that has the puppet stuff cooking. And we're about to start pulling that stuff together. So at the moment, it doesn't build you a functioning, the proper project doesn't build you a functioning lamp stack. Um, but uh, the work has been done, and it's just a matter of, of pulling that in. Um, so uh, as for what's in scope um, immediately, uh, so first off, as soon as we get that, that stuff merged together and thoroughly tested, uh, right, testing is the key. Um, as soon as we get that stuff merged together and thoroughly tested, the next step is, um, is adding the ability for someone to, um, to add on their chunk in a clean way so that you don't have to fork Proviso to add your editor, your thing. Um, and, and then um, the idea is that we're going to have stuff that seems of general interest. Um, we've been hashing out a plan to, that's related to that to allow you to flip on and off some of those things that are of general interest. So Mongo, Redis, Memcache are all becoming common enough components in a Drupal stack that we think it should be one line of configuration to turn those on or off. Um, in terms of what about my crazy idea, it's going to kind of be up to the people that weigh in in the issue queue to kind of decide that this is kind of in what should be in one of those like flip on offy things or not. Uh, I think what we were talking about last night is the idea that uh, the extensibility part needs thought and it will be like it's not something that's there right now. So we're erring on the side of like the most important thing we're trying to do is not alienate someone or not choose to say, hey, you, you're not doing it the way that this project wants to do it. Um, so until we have extensibility solved, which might be a while, the idea is have this just be a melting pot of different ways and make sure that these can go be turned on and off. Um, and we're not, we don't require someone to fork or say, oh, this doesn't solve, this isn't willing, this project isn't willing to entertain the way that I do deployments, whether I deploy with cookbooks, some people are against that. Like there's, there's lots of different variation. Um, Hopefully the core central things is in like what's, uh, I don't know, I guess the, what, what is, how do we optimize the, the MySQL part of the stack? That's more clear um, and it seems, I, I guess the, by the, the fact that Aquia and Pantheon essentially do this for the tons and tons of sites they deal with makes me feel that this is like, we can do this. <laughs> we can kind of come to some consensus. But they might also be optimizing it in different ways and if you're mm -hmm. trying to create an Aquia model and a Pantheon model because that's what somebody needs. They need it to match that. 
-hmm. you're going to have multiple configurations in there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure that you're necessarily going to want to be like the one true way to tune it because there isn't going to be one true way. You're, you're really creating sort of a, okay, here's, here's the aqueous stack as close as we can come, whether they share information or you go look at, you know, whatever pieces you can get to and say, okay, that's what we can clone um, versus the Pantheon stack. So our idea there is to create, um, to create the, the thing that we were talking about before about wrapper puppet modules and wrapper cookbooks that configure those other pieces. So the idea is that you, if you kind of wanted to get a sense for what in as far as they'll share or in as far as we can figure out um, what they've done to tune, you could kind of diff the Proviso MySQL Aquia wrapper with the Proviso MySQL Pantheon wrapper and kind of see how we think that they're tweaking there. Um, trick question, the Aquia and one would be uh, for Kona, I think. But. Right, and then, then at that point, that wrapper then actually has two pieces, one of which is a chef piece and one of which is a puppet piece. That's right. right. There, there'd sort of be parity. So, and then, and then, in the the issue of um, do we let something in when we get a submission for puppet, but we don't get a submission for chef, or vice versa? Um, the thing that we've landed on so far, and I would love to hear what you guys think about this, is um, when we accept that pull request for puppet, a an issue gets created for chef. And so that doesn't require the person that's contributing to do that because that's gonna put the brakes on the whole project. It's gonna seem insurmountable for someone that knows one side and not the other. Um, but the idea is that that then creates an issue for somebody on the other side of the team to start looking at. And again, increasing the conversation of seeing how it was done in Puppet and contrasting that with, with sort of how it's done in Chef and Ansible and any so other So there's a skill set have. here for people who speak more than one of those to act as sort of translators. And so that seems like a real need for this project that definitely needs to be addressed is you need to find people that have spent time learning both to do, be able to do translation. At the moment, um, we're training each other up and expecting that like as other people join the project, they'll get trained up too. Um, and I think that sort of serves a need in the community. As I've been talking to people, a lot of people have some buyer's remorse or anxiety about whether they made the right choice. Because I've heard people on both sides say, well, if I had it to do today, I think I'd go with the other one. Because um, the grass is always greener. Um, but the hope is that we can sort of get a better consensus about what the better sides of these different things are. Like, a puppet feature that I like is that it can show you a diff of what it would have done completely without actually touching your system. Um, as far as we can tell, Chef just can't do that for Chef some various reasons. What's that? No, Chef 11. Oh, Chef 11 can do it. Nice. Thanks, Nick. That's awesome. Um, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, con comparing and contrasting the tools, which are obviously getting better all the time. Every time I come up with something that's like, you know what, like, Puppet has this one thing. Like, I can hang on to that. This guy's always like, no, not anymore. Uh, and, and just want to say, like, we're, we're talking, like, at least in, in Chef World, like, we're talking about the idea of writing wrappers. And that's not, this isn't like a fringe thing. It's, it's a common pattern in how, um, how people design their infrastructures, at least in Chef World. I'm not sure about, about Puppet. Um, but, yeah, so we're not doing anything, like, crazy to solve our problems. Um, it's just, yeah, it's using a model that lots of other people use when they're designing. Hi, I think we're a bit short on time, but a few questions on uh, Puppet. I've been using Puppet this year, and I've found that the modules are often kind of hierarchical. Someone writes a module, they write a lot of modules which fit together. And even just building a LAMP stack, which we can use for Drupal or servers, it's not so easy that I find someone like Camp to Camp who produce lots of different modules, but you really have to go with them and use all the modules. But then I find You're something from Lullabob that's useful. And then I have another project where I need Postgres, and this Postgres depends on a WGET module, which is not going to play together with another module. And in the community, it doesn't seem to be as homogeneous how, or seems to be interference between modules which you don't have, for instance, the Drupal community. Yeah, um, I, don't, I'm, I haven't actually stated a question, but it's a question, is there such a thing as a pattern for how to use a provision a Drupal server on Puppet today, that there is a, la a consensus behind? Um, well, we're trying to work on building a consensus. Is that, um, a, is that a nasty question? <laughs> Sorry. A little bit. No, 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 I think you're right. Uh, Puppet, uh, more, way more in the Puppet community, people have been rolling their own. Um, than in the Chef community. In the Chef community, there's a ton of reuse, and I think the Puppet Forge has only really started to mature in the last year. 
Um, and it's and it's still kind of slow going. And I think you're thinking of example 42, um, where they have just this whole ecosystem, and you really have to buy into their whole stack for any of their pieces to work. And it makes some assumptions that just won't work with other module providers. Um, I think that's kind of being considered sort of bad form. There have been more blog posts about how to build Puppet modules that make sense. Um, I think Puppet Puppet as a language, it's Puppet's, Puppet's um, PSON format um, that you use to describe all your manifests has some limitations that are being worked on that have caused some of that fragmentation. But there absolutely are a bunch of modules that will play well with each other and don't bring with them a whole bunch of other dependencies other than Puppet standard lib, which pretty much everything works with. So, um, so, so what um, our, the pull request that's going to be landing uh, shortly that pulls together LAMP um, relies really heavily on the Puppet Labs modules. Those are all well written, as you'd kind of expect. Um, and they've got modules for Apache, MySQL. But some um, of those are like two years old. For instance, the, lo the Lullabot ones are way better. Sorry for the interruption. But the, um, Better, better is relative, um, and it depends on which ones you're talking about. Okay, I should join yeah. with this guys. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe have one time for one more question. I think we're out of time, actually. So, um, so we should just say, uh, yeah, we want you as a proviso contributor. Um, we would really love to get um, to get more hands on deck and get more of these conversations going about what puppet modules don't suck and. If there aren't any, we need to get the ones that suck least to really not suck or uh, write some of our own. Um, and that's, that's definitely some work to do, I think, on both sides, but especially, maybe especially on Puppet. Um, so join us on GitHub, um, which we're using GitHub so that we can interact more directly with the rest of the DevOps community, which is mostly on GitHub. Um, the pound per proviso on uh, Freenode. We've got our IRC room, and, um, and we've got a Google group. Um, that's mostly for announcements. We do um, we do Hangouts every other week on Friday on Google Hangout um, to just kind of hash out where we're at and what we're working on and what's up next. Um, so we hope to see you there. Thanks a lot. <laughs>